Bonjour. Uh, that's the last French word I'm going to say, sorry. Um, welcome to Kotlin Under the Covers. I am uh, Chet Haas. I work at Google. I'm on the developer relations team on Android. And I'm uh, Romain Guy, and I manage the Android Toolkit team. We thought it'd be interesting to look at aspects of Kotlin that um, are not necessarily obvious. It, there's a lot of very cool things about Kotlin, but it's not clear sometimes how they actually work underneath it. So we wanted to accomplish two things with the talk. One is explain how these things work uh, at the lower levels, and the other is to show you some ways to find out that information. So how did we figure this stuff out? All right, but before we get started, how many of you use Kotlin on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, not quite everyone. All right, so, and someone said more or less, like <laughs> Julien. Uh, anyway, so Kotlin is awesome. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the, li the list of reasons why Kotlin is awesome. Uh, that's beautiful code that Chet wrote. Uh, basically, it's concise. You have less boilerplate. Uh, it has a lot of powerful extension libraries. On Android, we wrote a lot of extension libraries that make the existing APIs of the platform uh, easier to use, for instance, so we don't have to go and revisit existing APIs. We can improve them after the fact. It is fully compatible with Java, uh, Android APIs. How many of you are Android developers in this room? Not that it matters, but okay, that's what we were expecting. Uh, we're not going to talk about Android today. Uh, so it, it mattered to us on Android because it's fully compatible with Java APIs, and our entire platform is made of Java APIs. Uh, and it has tons of modern language features. Uh, we're going to go. Th we're going to see some of them today, uh, and we're going to see how the compiler implements them. And sometimes it can be fascinating uh, for some definition of the world. Fascinating. Uh, and it's, it's still evolving. It's uh, actually pretty impressive to see the pace of development on Kotlin. Uh, we are at Kotlin 1.3, and JetBrain is still extremely busy implementing new features. I would say they might even go a little too fast, uh, because some of the features are still experimental. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple of those in this talk today. Uh, and they spread themselves a, a little thin, so there's a lot of features that are available, but not quite finished yet. Uh, anyway, a very interesting language, uh, and I think it's going to have a very promising future. So all of those lovely things about Kotlin, but... Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes. Okay, that the was totally worth it. All right. um, magical features, but not necessarily obvious features. So the two things we wanted to talk about today are um, how do these things actually work under the covers? And we're going to see details for various features that we found very interesting, how they got sort of twisted on the way down. Uh, and the other is, how do you actually figure this out? Most of our examplers are going to be using tools in Android. That's where we're coming from. Uh, when we talk about Kotlin, it's Kotlin for Android developers. None of the features we're going to talk about are specific to Android. Some of the tools um, are tools that we use on Android, but these same techniques apply elsewhere. Uh, we're going to talk about this in a different order, though. So how do you figure this out? What are the tools that we could use on Android? and elsewhere to actually figure this out. So there are three techniques that we use in figuring these out uh, ourselves and that we would recommend that people look into. Um, one is taking a look at the bytecodes, so what's actually being produced by Kotlin. So it goes through these class files, and we can take a look at what that bytecode actually looks like in various tools. Uh, we can also look at the decompiled bytecode, so if you don't really enjoy programming in assembly language or the Java programming languages version of assembly, uh, then you can actually decompile and see what the equivalent Java code would be like. Uh, and the other is to use tools that show you what the memory profile is like uh, at runtime. So see what's going on with the heap and whether things are being allocated, and then you can investigate why. So first of all, um, Let's take a look at an example. Yeah, so primitive types. Uh, just to show you an example of how Kotlin can differ from what you're used to with the Java programming language. So y let's say you declare a simple variable called i0 here. Uh, you assign the value 5, so obviously it's some kind of integer. So in Kotlin, the type is going to be int. And in Java, it's going to be int with a lowercase i. That is not surprising. Now, if we, s uh, if we explicitly declare the type of the variable, same thing happens. It's an int in both languages. Nothing new here. But Kotlin has the concept of nullability of types. So an int question mark is an integer that can also be null. Uh, and the type is represented as int que question mark. It's a different type than the regular integer. And in Java, suddenly, we change type as well. It's not the lowercase i int. It's not a primitive type anymore. It becomes an object, so the capital I integer. Um, and so this is, sorry, and this is a very simple example that shows, you know, where complexity can arise by just making this small change in, in your code, suddenly uh, you introduce objects, uh, which may not be what you wanted. Uh, 
All right, so let's take a look at a little bit of bytecode and see if we can figure this out. All right, makes sense? All right, moving on. All right, so in Android, we typically use Android Studio for doing development stuff. This is our IDE, and in this IDE, again, uh, I'm going to show an for, example. For those, for those of you who are yep. not familiar with Android Studio, it's uh, effectively a plugin on top of IntelliJ. So everything we talk about here is available in IntelliJ as well. Same menu, uh, you don't have to download Android Studio. If you happen to be using a different IDE for doing uh, Kotlin developments uh, elsewhere, if you're not doing Android, there are equivalent ways to do it there. But we'll show through IntelliJ. Uh, there's, through the menu, you can say, I want to see the bytecode for this thing, so we select that. And you can see the cursor was uh, highlighting a particular line of Kotlin code, and then you see the equivalent bytecode for that on the right. Um, or you could use the Java P uh, command line utility, and that would output something very similar, and you could just take a look at that listing of bytecode. So for the example we were looking at before, we have a variable that's going to be set equal to 25. Uh, so we can see the, the lines of interest there basically do uh, a byte push, a value of 25. It's a byte extended to an int value, and then it stores that uh, as, so it pushes it onto the stack, and then it takes that stack and puts it onto the first variable. Uh, the second line of code where we explicitly told it it's going to be a capital I int, uh, pushes that, again, uh, byte extended to int onto the stack, pops it into uh, the second variable, and then the third one, where we have a nullability, it's going to do something a little bit different. It's going to start out the same. It's going to push a value of 14 as a, an uh, integer onto the stack. And then it's going to call a static method value of, um, which looks like this. And value of returns an integer object. Uh, so that object is going to be returned. And instead of storing an int value uh, onto a local variable, it's going to store a reference to an object instead. So we've done an allocation of an object. We've returned it, and we've stored that as a reference. All right, so what if bytecode is a bit too much and you don't actually want to read that to figure out how things work? Um, those are pretty trivial examples. It can get a little bit more involved. Uh, it is fairly easy to take a look at the equivalent uh, Java code. So in Kotlin, uh, we have the following code here. And uh, at the top of that tool that we were showing you before that shows you the bytecode, there's a little button that says decompile. And decompilation results in this. And it's Java code that looks pretty similar, at least in this simple example, to uh, the Kotlin code. And then you can see exactly what's going on there. So we can see for that nullability parameter, it automatically gets extended to the Java type of integer in both of those cases. Um, pretty straightforward. So the third technique is to use a memory profiler. So uh, memory profiler that we have uh, for Android um, does various things for us. Uh, it allows us to track usage over time for what does the heap actually look like at any particular time, how large is the heap. We can see when garbage collection events happen, so what actually triggered that thing uh, and how long did that take. It's sort of a timeline view of what's going on with the heap. Um, it's also good for catching leaks. It used to be very painful on Android to track this. You had to take a dump and then translate that to some other format and then run an external tool to get all this information. So all of this is bundled into a, a single tool right now. And in particular, you can track allocations over time. This is very useful. We used to have a standalone tool for doing this. Again, now it's part of this overall memory profiler. And you can see when these things occurred. And then if you click on information about it, you can drill down and find the source code that actually produced the allocations. So let's take a simple and very dumb example here. Uh, this is code that I personally wrote. Um, so we're going to whip, whip through this loop. We're going to go through 10,001 times, and we're going to take a primitive int value um, uh, and set that into something that is nullable. So we know intuitively, because we worked through the previous example, that means that we're going to be boxing this thing and setting it to be an integer. Um, so we can see what's going on with the heap over time by running the profiler tool. Uh, down at the lower left of the IDE, that pops up a screen that looks like this. There are various tools that we have. If you click on the one that says memory there, the little, uh, the second green one, then you get an expanded view, and this shows what's happening with the heap over time. So what we're interested in is what happened to my heap? Why did I grow so much over that short period of time there? So you can take your cursor and you can drag over that and see what's going on, and that will show you all the allocations that occurred during that time period. So if you look closely, uh, we can see that there were almost 10,000 allocations of integers that occurred during that time period. Um, so the question is, why were those allocations occurring? But also, why isn't it actually 10,001, right? I have a loop of 10,001. So interlude, what's going on there? Um, 
So apparently, we can go through that loop 10,001 times and cause an auto-boxing uh, every single time, but not all of them actually result in allocations. Uh, and that is because uh, what is going on is uh, not doing that, but if we take a look at the implementation of value of, uh, when the runtime actually starts up, we cache uh, the uh, 255 values, right? So all the way up to uh, positive 127. So uh, we basically got free allocations for a bunch of values that are cached as soon as the runtime comes up, uh, which means that as we're going from zero up through 127, those just get returned from the cache and not allocated. Um, so that means that what we actually have when we went through the loop 10,001 times is allocations of 9,873, if you do the math. All right, so if you click on that line item, then you see all of the individual allocations that occurred during that time period, and you click on any one of those in particular, and it shows you the call stack. And you'll note um, that that call stack calls out that uh, the method where each of these al allocations was occurring was exactly uh, that line of code where we were doing the auto boxing inside the loop. All right, now we're gonna look at more complex examples. So the first one is the when statement in Kotlin. So it's the equivalent of switch uh, with the Java programming language. In particular, uh, we're going to take a look at when, when you switch on an enum. So here I have a simple enum class uh, that contains four values called opaque, transparent, fade, and add. And it doesn't matter what they mean or, or what they're called. Uh, and here's some code that I wrote that just uh, receives one, uh, uh, this enum as a parameter. Then we do an, uh, a when on it. And in every case, we just call a function. Again, it doesn't really matter what you're doing. The whole point is that we're switching on the enum. So the question is, what happens under the hood? What does the compiler generate? Um, so for this first example, uh, we, we wanted to talk about it because the Kotlin compiler does something that is exactly the same thing as the Java compiler, but still very interesting. Uh, and it's one of those features where uh, Chet mentioned earlier that you can use the decompile button uh, if you don't want to read bytecode. Sometimes you just want to see something that's more familiar, like Java code. The problem is, if you use the decompile button, you're not going to see what's actually happening. Um, so what's happening is this. So let's look at this bytecode. So first we load something, uh, we load a constant, and then we call this uh, method called uh, enum switch mapping. We get a static field, sorry. So blending kt is the class, is my uh, Kotlin class that I created that contains the enum. And then there's an inner class called when mappings. And inside this when mapping, there's something interesting called enum switching. And if you look at the uh, type defined at the end of the line, it's this uh, square bracket i, that means it's an array of integers. So what this code does is it loads that uh, array of integers that's buried somewhere in a class that was generated by the compiler. Then it calls the ordinal method on my actual enum. And then it uses that as an index into the array. And then we see the actual switch. So the switch is done not on the index of the enum value itself. It's done on another value that is found inside an array. And we access that value using the value of the enum itself. So let's take a, another look. Um, so here, and you can see here, that's one of the case statements. So we switch on the value that we got from the array, then we reach uh, finally the code that we wanted. So let's take a look at this uh, at those actual array. So here's the example. I wrote one switch, and we can see if we decompile the code, we do see the array. It's called enum switch mapping zero. It has the length of uh, our, our enum. It has as many entries as our enum itself. And then we have a static initializer uh, that populates this array using the ordinal values of the enum. And then it, uh, it uh, assigns values that are generated by the compiler, so they're always positive values, like one, two, three, four. Now, um, so first of all, that's interesting, because that means that when you do an enum, uh, when you do a switch or when, uh, you're generating more code that will have to be initialized when you load the class. So, you know, of course, most of the time, it's not going to matter. But you have highly performance-sensitive code that can start becoming an issue if you have a lot of those. It will also affect uh, uh, cache coherency. So it forces a jump uh, through another variable. So if you do this kind of stuff in a tight inner loop on something that's extremely performance critical, you might be polluting the, the, the memory cache of the CPU. So now let's create a second method that does another switch. Uh, still on the same enum, we still switch over all the, the, the different cases, uh, all the different values of the enum. We just do something different. Now if we look at the generated array, we see there's a second one that was created. It's the same length, it contains the exact same mapping, which shows that every time you do a switch or every time you do when on an enum, it doesn't matter how many times you do this in your code, you're going to get a new array that will have to be initialized and allocated. And finally, if I do uh, yet another switch, this time I, I switch on the, the, the enum values in a different order, 
uh, it, the same thing happens. We just get a new array with just a different mapping. So the compiler doesn't try to do anything smart. Uh, if you have the same mapping over and over again, it's just going to create a new array every single time. Let's talk about lazy properties. Lazy are a, it's a particular instantiation of delegate properties, which we have in Kotlin. Um, it's also an encapsulation of a really common technique that we all use quite often um, to avoid doing work until we actually need the work to happen. Uh, this, it's a typical pattern. It's not really that hard to deal with, um, but they just sort of make it easy at a language level. So if I were doing this manually for lazy, um, if I wanted to do something really dumb, which is uh, do you know lazy instantiation of an int value, um, this is not something I'd recommend in general, but to make the example very simple, I'd say, okay, well, maybe I have an underlying variable that's gonna be nullable, and I'll set that to be null, uh, and then I'm, I'm going to have this int value that doesn't get assigned until I actually need it. And then the Kotlin code to do that would be maybe this, so we're gonna have a getter, and it says, okay, if this is null, then assign it, and then return the value, and otherwise, it'll never be null again, so we'll just return the value. So this is a dumb example, nobody should ever do this, um, but it's pretty close to a typical example where maybe you have a small data structure like a rect object or a point object, something that's going to allocate more than just one uh, thing, and then maybe you've decided, okay, well, I may not always need this thing, and so why don't I just delay this until later in the code? Uh, so an example of something that is actually quite common. All right, so this manual approach uh, in decompiled Java looks pretty similar. So we have the underlying variable, we have a getter, uh, it finally sets it, and then it returns it. So um, very straightforward, the Kotlin to Java mapping is, is very similar. Um, the automatic approach, however, is not quite as obvious. Um, so we have this uh, syntax that says by lazy, and then you have this value. So you have this lambda that's gonna execute uh, when the value is actually needed. And this is what happens internally. So first of all, there's uh, this property, uh, there's this type called K property, which is used for reflection on properties in Kotlin. So there are things that you can do in Kotlin which you cannot do in Java, so they needed an additional mechanism. That specifically, you, they wanted you to be able to reflect into these uh, mechanisms, and if it doesn't exist at the Java language level, well, they needed another mechanism to do that. So they came up with this K property type, and they're going to potentially use reflection in getting information that they need to uh, in property delegates. So we need a K property, and we're going to have an array that stores these K properties. So right off the bat, you've allocated an array, and you've allocated a K property uh, type to go inside of that array, and it has all the information that that K property needs, the name of the class, the name of the uh, variable, and the type. All right, and then uh, we have this call into lazy. So it says, okay, the, the delegate is actually going to be a call into this lazy method that's going to return this lazy type, and that is the type that we use to actually call in and get the underlying value uh, when we need it. So get lazy uh, int is going to actually assign that thing, and then inside of that it says, okay, get the value and then return the int value from this. So all of this is sort of overhead and getting to actually getting the int value, and potentially this could end up in a reflection call, right? It's going to, you know, it's got this K property object and it could dive into there and use reflection to call in and get the value. They're a little more clever than that in the compiler and they say, okay, specifically in the lazy approach, we're going to have uh, a methods, uh, uh, extension method here so that if we're actually using this lazy uh, object that we get back, then we're going to implement the get value and we're gonna call directly. So we're not gonna use reflection, that's awesome. We didn't have to call through K property, that's just like extra overhead that's being passed around, but we don't use reflection to get the value. Uh, but the implementation of that, that uh, getter is here. We actually do end up in a synchronized block because you need to make sure that all this stuff is thread safe. Uh, so, bunch of code, couple of conditions, a little bit of synchronized overhead, and also um, all of this code that uh, sets all this stuff up at the beginning, right? So, this is what happens when you declare lazy. So, in order to avoid allocating an int object, I did all of this. I allocated at least two objects, I instantiated a bunch of initialization code to set up the lazy mechanism, uh, and then I went through a couple of conditions in a synchronized block just to avoid allocating an int object. Yeah, and um, the, r the reason we, we like this example is because I actually caught that in code review uh, a couple of months ago where someone was working on a new widget for Android and they needed a rectangle as a field in a class. And you know they wanted to be super smart and say, well, we don't need a rectangle very often, so I'll just do a by lazy on the rectangle. And a rectangle on Android is just for float values. There's no code in the constructor. It doesn't do anything. 
And then I showed them what actually happens when you do by lazy to save the allocation of a rectangle. They were actually uh, using more memory and more CPU time, uh, so it was a bad optimization. So by all means, use by lazy, but it's really for expensive stuff, not for trivial objects. Uh, so unsigned, that's one of the experimental features that appeared in Kotlin 1.3. Uh, so it's support for unsigned numbers. This is something that you can do in C or C++, but this is not available in the Java programming language. Uh, the, the JetBrains uh, folks uh, discovered there's actually a very easy way to implement unsigned numbers uh, on the JVM or other similar runtimes. So they, they, they added the feature in the language, and we'll see that they added a new generic feature called inline classes to be able to implement unsigned numbers. So first we're gonna look at unsigned numbers. So this is how you use them. Uh, here I declared two variables A and B. Uh, I use the U uh, uh, suffix to indicate that they are unsigned values, which is pretty obvious since they're positive numbers. And then I just declared a C value that adds those two numbers. So if we look at the code that's generated by the compiler to implement this, it's actually very interesting. Uh, for the first value, we just push a constant, just a regular integer, so a sign integer uh, on, this, on the stack, and then we store that into the first variable. We do the same thing for the second value. So here the compiler is smart enough to uh, know that because those values are positive, they can just be represented by an integer. And then when we add those two values, uh, the compiler just loads them and then calls the iAd uh, opcode. So iAd is just the integer addition. And it turns out that whether or not your values are signed or unsigned, all the, most of the mathematical operations on integers will work just fine because of how integers are defined in the Java uh, spec. So the, the way the overflow works will just make uh, unsigned numbers work just fine. So they didn't have to implement anything specific in the VM uh, or the compiler or the language, they just treat them like regular integers. Now they do one more thing uh, that's specific to unsigned. They call this static function uh, called uint.constructor-impl. And it takes an integer and returns an integer. So now let's take a look at this function and what does it do? Uh, and that's where like sometimes what the Kotlin compiler does baffles me a little bit. Um, so it takes the integer as a parameter, it loads it, and then it returns it. And that's all it does. Um, so I'm not sure why they bother calling this every single time, but it will. So uh, I guess more work for the JIT uh, or your ahead of time compiler. So pl the plus operator on unsigned numbers is implemented with I add, so the integer addition. Uh, the subtraction is implemented with I sub. Multiplication is I mol. Uh, and the only operation that cannot be implemented directly uh, with the existing opcode is the division. So when you use a division on unsigned numbers, they have to invoke a static functi function called uh, uin divide. And if you look at it, it's fairly complicated, uh, but that was the only way to, to make it work. So unsigned numbers are awesome because they're basically cheap, and I find them really useful in my code because sometimes um, that's what you want. You expect, for instance, if you want to declare a width of a, or height, it will be a positive value. And by using the new uint types uh, in your code, you can by contract at compile time ensure that the values are correct. Now, one more thing that uh, is a little weird with uh, unsigned numbers uh, is the way, uh, so sorry, uh, oh yeah. First, let's, let's take a look at how uh, they're, they're converted into strings. So here I have two numbers, an unsigned and a, and a signed uh, integer, and then we just print them. We first print the signed number and then the unsigned one. Uh, so for the signed number, sorry, for the signed number, it works exactly as expected. There's a, an override of the print function that takes an integer, so it just calls that function. But for the unsigned, it will first call this uh, static method called box impl And as you can see, it returns a new instance of a class called uint. So the, com the compiler generates that for you. Then it calls the generic version of print that takes an object. And they had to do that because the two-string function has to know that the number is unsigned. So that's not unexpected, but that means that there will be boxing happening. And we'll see there are other, so other gotchas with uh, inline classes in a little bit. All right, ranges. Um, I think one of the most surprising things to people that are new to Kotlin is, how do I do a for loop? Right? I'm used to, all, all of us grew up on you know, for loops in whatever, C, C++, Java, it all looks the same until you hit Kotlin. Um, and then you start dealing with these ranges instead. We don't just do the you know, start, end, whatever. Instead, you set up a range and then you iterate through that range. So for I, uh, in this range, uh, inclusively, zero through 10, we do the following, uh, or we're gonna do zero until 10, uh, we do the following, or we could just do repeat the following thing 10 times, or we could put the range first and say, for this range, we're gonna do a for each 
on the following uh, predicate. And all of these are implemented a little bit differently. Um, the first three, it's sort of obvious. Okay, yep, it looks pretty much the same. So it sort of transcodes uh, into kind of what we would expect at the Java level. There's a start value, there's an end value, and we're gonna go through it. Second one, same thing, except we're not gonna include the max value there. Um, third one, very similar. Uh, so this is all doing exactly what we want. And then the last one is a little less obvious. We create uh, this range, this int range object, uh, and then we iterate through it with an iterable each time. So they all kind of look the same if you squint on the left, but they're not necessarily all implemented the same on the right. Uh, the, the surprising one, you know, tell them about the step value. Uh, yeah, so the, the, there's another feature of the ranges in, in Kotlin is called step. So if you use this variant of the for loop, uh, it will increment i by one every time, but let's say you want to increase i by two uh, every time you loop. So you can use this keyword called step. So here we're going from zero to 10 inclusive and we increase i by two every time. And we just saw on the previous slide that when you use this form of the for loop, it does basically what we expect. It's just a regular you know, for loop as you would write it in the Java programming language. Now when you do it this way, it turns into this. Uh, <laughs> it's quite different. And it's actually interesting because there's a lot of optimizations the compiler could do here. So it does create a new int range, uh, passes it to a step static function that will just return what's called a progression. Uh, and then it just asks for the first value, the last value, and the step value of the progression, which is bizarre because you wrote those values in the code to begin with. Uh, and then the compiler just makes sure that the beginning of the range is not after the end of the range uh, and just skips the loop if it's that's the case. And then it finally, it does a, a while true loop uh, and exits the loop when the, the value has reached the, the, the correct one. Um, so here, obviously, the compiler could do something way smarter than this. There's allocations that shouldn't be there. Uh, and even if you do a step of one, uh, all that code will be generated. So another example of where the Kotlin compiler could be a little bit smarter. All right, so when we looked at unsigned numbers, I mentioned inline classes. So inline classes are, uh, I mean, it's in the name. <laughs> Basically, an inline class is a class that can wrap only a single value. It can be a primitive type or it can be a reference, but there can be only a single field, if you will. And what the compiler will do is everywhere you pass that inline class, the class will just disappear and be replaced by that single field. And that's how unsigned numbers work. When you manipulate unsigned in Kotlin, you just use the uint u int class. But as we saw in the generate bytecode, we just end up with integers instead. So here, let's take a look at a slightly more complex example. So we have a color class, uh, and it wraps an integer. So it's a 32-bit integer, and something we do commonly in uh, graphics, or that we do a lot on Android, is we encode uh, uh, RGB values and the alpha channel inside an integer. And here I created the several getters that will just shift and mask uh, the underlying integer to return the value of the red channel, the green channel, the blue channel, and the alpha channel. Uh, so now let's take a look at an example of how we would use that class. So if you look at the main function at the bottom, I create a new instance of my color class, I pass it some constant, and then I call this print function that I've created. And that print function just calls the, all the getters that, uh, that I've uh, declared. And if we look at the generate bytecode, uh, it looks like this. First, in the, the, the main function, we load our constant on the stack, that was that, that weird hex value that I uh, created. It calls that constructor dash impl function that we saw in the case of unsigned. So here it does exactly the same thing. It receives an integer and returns the integer right away. It's completely useless. Uh, and then finally, we invoke our print function. But you can see it's not called print color anymore. It's called print color dash some number that was obviously generated. And it doesn't take an instance of color anymore. It takes an integer as a parameter. So that shows that with inline classes, you know, it's, it's called a zero cost abstraction. Uh, you can use, use them as a class, but they don't have the cost of a class. There's no allocation. Until you hit something like this. Uh, we declare two color instances, A and B. Uh, they're inline classes, so they should just disappear. And then we're just going to print whether or not those two values are equal. And we do it in two different ways. First, we use the equal equal operator, which, is in, Kotl which in Kotlin will basically call dot equals on, on the object or we call dot equals directly ourselves. Uh, so if we look at the generated code, um, first we load our, our a value, uh, and we call this box impl function. It takes an integer, returns our color class. So we're already boxing one of the two values. Then it does the same thing for the other one. So now we, have, we started with two integers, a and b, and they just got auto-boxed, so we created allocations. And finally, it invokes a static function called r equal that takes two objects. 
so you have to be really careful here because, again, most of the time it won't matter at all. But if you're writing highly performance sensitive code and you just want to compare two inline classes using equal equal, every single time you're going to create two allocations uh, just when you could just compare the integers that are, for instance, inside the, the class. What's interesting is that if instead we call a dot equals b, only one of the values will be boxed automatically. So you already saved 50% uh, of your allocations right there. And I think the reason is because if you look at the contract of equal equals, it checks for nullability. Um, and here the, co the compiler knows that one of the two values is non-nullable, so it can uh, skip one of the boxing. A simple example, let's look at arrays. Uh, sort of matters how you declare these things. So here we have int array of, uh, which is going to give us something with type inference with those values. And at the Java decompiled level, it does sort of what we'd hope. It's an array of primitive values. Over here, we say array of uh, instead of int array of. We didn't really specify. Even though we're passing in these integers, I would think that type inference would say, well, you know, obviously it's an array of ints. Um, it is an array of integers because it doesn't know quite enough uh, to make the right decision there. So it boxes each of those and returns an array of those. Uh, and then down at the bottom, we say int array uh, of three, and then give it a predicate, uh, lambda there, and uh, that does, again, what we would sort of hope, and, and we get this primitive array that it whips through um, and then calls the lambda for each one of those. And speaking of lambda, uh, so that one is not really, it's a surprising behavior. So let's say that you have a, here we have a Java API, it's a widget, uh, like we have a lot of them on, on Android. Uh, we have a listener uh, with a single method, uh, and then we have a way to add a listener and remove a listener. So nothing really fancy, uh, pretty common code. Now, if we try to use this API from uh, Kotlin, you know, we're going to instantiate a widget, and then I'm going to create a listener that's just a lambda because uh, Kotlin can automatically convert a lambda into uh, what's called a s it's called SAM conversion, like a single abstract method method interface. So typically, runnable is one of those, or any listener that has only one one method in it. So we declare our listener as a lambda. And it matches the the sorry the API surface of our listener. It takes a widget as a parameter and then does something with that. So then we call add listener and we print the number of listeners we have on our widget. Uh, it's going to print one. And then if we call remove listener with our listener and we print the number of listeners we have, it's still going to say one. Uh, so it was not removed. And here's the reason why. So if you look at the generated code, it looks like this. Uh, the listener is declared as something called function one. It's a very special type uh, that's used by the Kotlin compiler for a function that takes a, a single parameter. And then you can see that uh, it's going to take our listener, so that's our the actual lambda we wrote, and it's going to wrap it into a synthetic class called, in this case, lambda kt dollar uh, sign sam dollar sign widget listener zero. And then it's going to pass that to the add listener function. So the compiler has to do this because we declare just a naked lambda and our Java code expects an actual type called uh, widget.listener. And so the class that was generated by the Kotlin compiler implements that interface and just wraps our lambda with it. So obviously what happens is that when we call remove the listener, the same thing happens again. Our listener gets wrapped in yet another instance of that synthetic class. So we called add listener with one instance of the listener, but then we call remove listener with a different instance of the listener, and that's why it doesn't get removed. And this is a mistake that is very easy to make uh, when you write Kotlin code. Uh, the fix is very simple. You just have to specify the actual type uh, that you want to use, and then the problem just goes away. Extension function. So this is a little uh, unobvious unless you look at how these things happen. So extension functions allow us to declare uh, methods directly on classes, even if those methods are not there to begin with, very useful. Uh, it can make very elegant code. You can basically add to APIs uh, inside your own codes. Um, so here we have this class called superclass, and then we have a subclass that implements that. So subclass is a subclass of superclass. Uh, then we're going to declare a couple of extension functions. So we have get identifier, and the get identifier for the superclass returns super. Get identifier for subclass returns sub. And now we're going to create a couple of uh, instances. So we have an instance of the superclass, an instance of the subclass, and then an instance of the subclass, which has been cast to the superclass. So the question is, what happens when we call each of these methods? So we're going to call get identifier on the superclass, on the subclass, on the sub that was cast to the super, 
and then on the sub that's cast at runtime to the super as well. And the question is, what does each of these return? So the first one calling it on the super will return. Right, excellent. And on the sub returns. All right. And the next one, sub as super returns. Super. Uh, and finally, the last one returns super as well. So why, right? These were subclasses. We're clearly calling the method on the subclass object no matter what we cast it to. So what's actually going on? So extension functions are implemented as static functions. So at the Java language level, we have something like this where we have the get identifier as a static method that takes a superclass and as a static method that takes the subclass. So then when we call it from each of these, uh, so here the super instance is calling it and it is passing in a superclass type. Uh, so it's obviously going to call the static method that takes a superclass type. Um, same thing for the sub. And then when we cast the sub as super, it is now a superclass type. So it's going to call the method that actually takes that type. And same for the last one. So it makes sense when you look at how it's implemented. Maybe not from the outside, though. Right. On two default parameters. So it's a powerful feature of the Kotlin language. When you create a function, you can specify default values for the different parameters of the function. And then when you invoke the function or method, uh, you can omit some of those parameters, or you can just name them directly if you want to specify the value of just one of them. So here I created an extremely useful function that just adds two floats. And for some reason, those two floats have a default value if you don't bother uh, specifying them. Uh, so what does the compiler generate when you compile that, that function? Uh, the first thing it generates is this. It makes a lot of sense. We have a function that takes two floats and adds them. Uh, that's what it is. And then it generates a second function that's a little more complicated. And it looks like this. So it's called adder uh, dollar sign default. It takes the two floats that we've declared. And it also takes an int and an object. So the object, uh, I haven't seen it being used. It's always, uh, it always receives the value uh, null. Um, and I believe it's just meant to tag this, this function so that it, it doesn't conflict with anything else. What's very interesting is the int itself. So that integer is used as a bit field. It will, the compiler will populate that int uh, to let the function know which ones of the parameter you've provided a value for. So you can see in the implementation, we, do, uh, we mask that field and we say, if the first bit um, of, the, of that integer is not set, that means that the caller did not specify a value for that parameter. And therefore, we're going to use the value that we had declared in our uh, original definition. And it's going to do this for every single parameter of the function. So let's see what happens when we call that function in different ways. So if I call the function by not specifying any parameters, it's going to pass the default value of the, of the given type. So it's going to be 0 for floats. And you can see that the int is 3. Uh, that means that the bits number 1 and 2 are set. Uh, and then there's this null. Uh, if we specify only parameter name a, you can see that the value that I specified 3 is present. Uh, but b remains at 0. And the bit field now is only set to 2. Uh, if I specify bits, the other way around, the bit field is set to 1, uh, and there's no value for a. And then if you specify both values, it's going to skip uh, this new generated function and just call the version that takes all the values uh, to begin with. Now, uh, since it's using a bit field and in an integer you can only have 32 bits, uh, what happens if you use more than 32 parameters in your function? Uh, you probably shouldn't do that, but just in case. Uh, I tried it for you. Here's what it looks like. So here I have 33 parameters, uh, and we just return the sum. And Kotlin will actually create two bit fields. Uh, it's very simple. It makes a lot of sense. But What's better than a bit field? Uh, I was only surprised fields. it worked. <laughs> yeah, I thought you would just like s give up and throw an error. All right, uh, last example, coroutines. How many of you are familiar with coroutines? Uh, all right, so uh, coroutines are effectively for asynchronous programming. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of details about how they work. <coughs> or at least w how you would use them. But here's an example of a, of a coroutine. Uh, I'm going to show you an example of a coroutine. So first, you need a suspend function. So it's a function that will typically do a lot of work. Uh, in that case, we just call delay, which basically pauses the current uh, thread or the current coroutine for one second. So it prints a message and then pauses for one second. Uh, then I have a main function where we're just going to print a message saying that we're starting the work, we're launching a coroutine. Uh, then I, I launch my coroutines and I call the compute function twice. Uh, and finally, we print that we're exiting. And at the end, I, I, I added a sleep of three seconds to make sure that everything that the coroutine does uh, is, uh, has been done. So if you execute this code, unsurprisingly, you're going to see that we're launching the coroutines, we're 
calling the compute suspend function once, a second time, and then we exit. Now, what's interesting is how, this, how does this work? Um, so your coroutine, the lambda of your coroutine, generates a ton of code, and it generates a new class that, in, that implements a function called invoke suspend. Um, and you can see the first thing it does is switches, it switches on a field called label. And then in the different cases, you can recognize the work that our coroutine was doing. So here, if you look at case zero, for instance, um, we first set the label to one, and then we call the compute function that we've created. So coroutines are effectively implemented as state machines. Uh, and they are re-entrant state machines, as we're, gonna as we're gonna see in a little bit. So after we called uh, the, the compute function once, you can see that it returns, it adds a return value, and it's a, a constant in Kotlin called suspended. And so if your coroutine is doing something that can take a long time, like uh, this delay function, this pause function, it's gonna return from the coroutine and get back to it at some point in the future uh, when there might be some more work to do and we're done with the, the heavy work. Uh, so that was the, the first case, and you can see then there's the, uh, the second case in the state machine where we advance the state of the state machine and we call compute for the second time. Uh, so what I did to better understand uh, how coroutines are implemented, I hacked the bytecode. So this is the original bytecode, and I added some more stuff at the beginning. You don't have to worry about uh, understanding that stuff, but basically added prints. Because uh, I wanted to know how many times do we re-execute the coroutine code itself. So after uh, doing this, if we relaunch the application, so that was the original print that we were getting in the console, uh, I was getting this. So as you can see, we launched the coroutine, we enter our state machine the first time, and the state is set to zero. Then we call our compute function, our suspend function. Then we re-enter the state machine, which means that the compute function uh, returned from the state machine uh, as, we as we were expecting, and the state was now one, and the same thing a third time. Um, so doesn't impact you in, 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 in many ways, but just know that whenever you use a coroutine in your code, a bunch of code is generated and you have state machines everywhere, uh, but you should probably not care. All right, so after all of this stuff, and there are other language features that are similarly unobvious under the hood, the real question is, um, does it matter? Should you actually care about this stuff? So on Android, we told people for years, like, avoid allocations at all costs. Allocation and collections are really expensive. Not as much the case maybe on the back end or desktop machines, um, but still you kind of want to know when expensive things are happening. So on Android, we try to avoid that. However, we told people more recently, actually our runtime has gotten a lot better. You really shouldn't worry about allocations. Um, and then we're telling you about all these things that cause allocations under the hood with Kotlin. So What's going on? Like, should you actually care about this? Um, no, the runtime is actually pretty good on Android. Uh, not a big deal anymore. Allocations and collections are pretty fast. Uh, they've, the runtime has sort of gotten to the mo modern world finally. So all of that's really good. However, it's kind of good to understand what's actually going on. So the higher level the language gets, the more you kind of need to know, okay, well, what's actually going on over there in case there are implications for your code. For example, um, what is the overhead that's being incurred? Am I avoiding lazy creation of a rect object just to cause more allocations of more objects and more work going on at initialization time? Or what is actually going on in my inner loop? Right. So if I'm actually in performance critical code, well, we're not at the C level where we have control over everything going on. So we do need to understand how the thing works that we are in control of, and then you can make the right decision for your code. Um, that is all for the talk. We have. Uh, a slide that says Q&A that I just skipped. Uh, uh, we're happy to take, I think, one question, and that's, and then they're going to turn the mics off and the lights, and, and we're all kicked out. So one quick question, yes. Uh, yeah, so did we raise these issues with the Kotlin team? So yeah, we work closely with them. They're aware of a lot of those, and we have people working on the Kotlin compiler uh, at Google, uh, actually specifically on the Android team. And on Android specifically, we also have a, cool call, a tool called R8. Uh, it's kind of like ProGuard, so it's an optimizer. Um, and there's a lot more you know, issues similar to those, and R8 will optimize some of those, and I'm sure like at some point ProGuard will, will do the same. Uh, so yeah, it will get better, uh, I suppose. And it's not bad. Like, it's just All right, and thank you very it. much. Merci.